been a fun. DJ, what is going on, my man? How's it going? I'm in. I'm in. Like, <laughs> you can see, I'm burnt to a crisp. <laughs> You're where? I'm in the Dominican Republic. I'm completely burnt up. <laughs> <laughs> I've been working outside all day, so yeah. Are you <laughs> okay. Well, well, good. I mean, I, I, hopefully you're catching some. You're, I, I, apparently, you're catching some sunshine over there, huh? <laughs> I'm catching a lot of sunshine over here. So, yeah, I'm a guide. <laughs> uh, awesome, awesome. Well, look, I, I really appreciate you taking once again the uh, time here. Uh, to dig into your new movie, Studio 666. Absolutely. Uh, honestly, more fun than I even imagined. I thought there was going to be a lot of fun gags. There was going to be some, you know, some, some fun humor in it. And it's always, you know, kind of one of those things where you have to balance comedy and horror. Sometimes it can go a little too far. I, I thought this landed absolutely. And I, I completely fucking loved it, man. So congrats, first of all, on the movie. It's awesome. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, that, I mean, that's the hard balance horror and comedy and things like that you know and like you know this movie when we did it we we knew it wasn't going to be for everybody but we knew what we were wanting to do so we had a lot of fun with it and i think we succeeded with what we tried to go out for <laughs> absolutely absolutely all right so so kind of digging into i didn't want to do too much research in this because i i wanted to hear it you know fresh from yourself but i also didn't want to ask the same shit you're hearing over and over uh one of the things i did i, I did hear you know you mentioned in an interview as far as once reading the script is that you had created a lookbook for studio 666 and kind of presenting different ideas uh what what, what was included in this lookbook and you know what what kind of went into it from this book that went straight to the movie Mostly with the things that I was kind of presenting was I got the pitch idea from Dave and uh, went into it. Mostly mine was more backstory of like the, what the uh, what the shadow people at the first band were going to like the first script they weren't like or the original pitch idea there. So I took about you know um, and my phone, my phone. I think I have bad reception. Um, I wanted to like kind of do a throwback fog, um, and but add a little bit more of an element to it, like where they like like a little bit more like baby movement things like that. And so I, I put a bunch of ideas together, just some like like some comic art kind of things like that. Also, just like the mood of like what I thought the nights should look like, or what the house should look like, or how would you go about doing that stuff. That was really kind of more my lookbook of like what I was doing, more of like a creature design, but like old yeah. cool creature design, like the fog. <laughs> That's kind of weird. Okay. Now, and, and I mean, it's funny too with, and, and before going any further, if anybody hasn't seen the movie, there might be a couple, I'm going to try my best to not, you know, dig too far into spoilers because I'd love, you know, anybody who hasn't seen the movie to see it. Um, but kind of in mentioning, you know, it's funny you mentioned the fog, you know, and then end up somehow having John Carpenter in the movie. And then as well as, you know, conducting the uh, initial piece there. Uh, what an odd circle, huh? <laughs> yeah. No, Crazy. It, it's funny because because John wasn't originally involved with the whole thing. It's like when we first started talking about, it, we were just talking about making this movie, um, and then we, you know, later on we started talking about scores and like the music and how that that should be and how it should go. Um, we didn't really have a composer at that point, so then we were just like, all right, well, you know, let's reach out to John Carpenter and see if he'll like write us a theme song or something. So that's what we did. We reached out to him and we, got, you know, he was down to do it. And then Roy Moyorga, the drummer for Ministry. Um, he's been like wanting to do scores and I mean, like, com you know, combined with John Carpenter and Roy putting that all together, you know, it was a perfect mix. So we're really, we were really lucky to not only have his score, you know, with John Carpenter, Daniel Davies, and, you know, and Cody Carpenter, but also uh, Roy Moyorga to finish it off. And it was like a whole like amazing, you know, group of musicians, like all together. Plus John Carpenter is my all time basic hero of, you know, film director. <laughs> right. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, I was gonna mention Roy too as well, you know, as far as his work in that and then also having, you know, the background that he does in drums and, and music, you know, too. It was kind of sick as far as looking further into that and seeing like all aspects of this movie a lot, you know, kind of helm from this crossover of horror movies into music or vice versa, you know. I I mean I guess when I thought the Foo Fighters, I never thought of a horror movie, but you know, as far as the the the, right. the music background and then you know going into having the, the movie based around them. That was absolutely rad. But yeah, Roy as well, you know, his, his work too is so sick. Loved it. Yeah. So exactly. It was really it, good. Cause, you, Cause with your movie, you got to have the vibe and the music really helps with the vibe and the flow of the movie and the emotion of what's going on subject wise in the movie. 
And you know, it's yeah. really important for composers to really understand that stuff. Yeah, so I, 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 I felt that there were certain moments too that it kind of, you know, helped like interweave it. I mean, I don't know if, has Roy ever uh, ever scored a film before? Was this his first time? I think he is, was, I, when I first met with, with Roy, he was uh, composing a movie that had like Arnold Schwarzenegger's son in it that like he would show me some samples of what it was and I don't know the name of the movie, but I, I loved what he was doing. And I went, when I went into his studio, I knew that he was the right guy because he really had like this huge setup, kind of like a Hans Zimmer deal, like or like oh, the old school, um, and I don't even know what you call it. It's like the move, not the move, but it's uh, uh, it's like all these switches and there's like all this stuff. It looks like a huge computer board. Sure. Um, basically, you know, he had theremins, he had his drums, he had his whole studio set up, and then not only that, but he had the three masks from Halloween uh, three, you know. <laughs> with the and then he had a Barlow you know, mask and he had a Michael Myers mask. He actually makes masks. And so I was like, okay, Roy's the guy. Whoa. So he, you know, he's ultimately super talented. You know, he's fantastic. So, yeah, I mean, we, we, re we really lucked out. Wow. Yeah, I love that. That's awesome. So, yeah. so now as far as while discussing the lookbook with Dave, you know, were there certain designs or pieces that, you know, he took interest in right away, you know, as far as maybe looking through some of the stuff and like this has to end up in the movie. I don't give a shit what we have to do. No, it really wasn't. A, the lookbook wasn't really, it was more what we were going for and like how we wanted to like, so like when, when I, whenever I got, I wanted to like, I wanted to like the move I Part and with directors of photography, like really very, very visual, but the, the dialogue that's coming from the Foo Fighters obviously but it's supposed to be like that, like a legit looking. And that was what yeah. I wanted to portray. Not, a lot of comedies are very like brightly lit. Um, but it, I wanted to be this more of a like horror film you know, and just sure okay and, and, and i mean along with that too you know there's yeah okay okay and, and there's there's certainly that horror aesthetic with it you know i mean it wasn't i i felt like it wasn't kind of uh out balance as far as being a comedy as opposed to a horror i felt like at first and foremost you know at the heart of it it was a horror movie you know with the the fun elements that were sprinkled in there too but you know as far as with the the initial like aesthetics and inspirations for the movie uh you'd sat down and discuss with dave you know different interests in film and directors and bands and things like that what what films directors or bands you know, kind of were mentioned as far as choices uh you know and maybe even something that kind of surprised you for an inspiration for this Again, I went the Carpenter route, and also like Wes Craven, uh, that kind of that that kind of feel. I wanted wanted that. Um, we talked we, basically; those are the kind of ones I wanted to go with. Or the Stan Rain, like like we really kind of reference like that vibe in this movie, also with the book that like, like the rack when it comes to a lot of things like that. Like, you know, there's a lot of kind of deals through into the try to like throw back like the other films. We just didn't, like, you know, we didn't you know, it is the Foo Fighters make an album, but we also wanted to make sure that when he was trying to make this album, it was very much more of like something not really in their realm. And, and, and it kind of went more to like this weird, you know, stoner rock, black metal, punk rock, you know, 90s rock, like conglomeration. You know, we just kind of go all over the place because Dave's also like trying to figure out in his head to complete this song. Um, but it was very much not just a Foo Fighters style. It kind of trailed off into what the Dream Widow band was doing in the 90s that was possessing Dave. Um, yeah. So we wanted to have okay. our own life. And, and so, like, there's a Dream Widow album that's going to be coming out, I think, it's the next week. Um, that is, you know, Dave did it. And, and it's, uh, it's, <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> it's, it's heavy. I've heard it. It's super, super heavy. I think all the people that like Crowbot are really going <laughs> to. They're going to love it. So. Oh, man. I, I mean, you know, that was the funny thing, too, was, like, I was kind of wondering as I'm watching the movie, as far as the music that's playing and, you know, the kind of the, the song that, you know, that, that the band is trying to write and seemingly so the rest of the band is fucking sick of, you know, as soon as they started writing it. But um, I, I thought it was, you know, it was funny because it was like, dude, this is a sweet song. Like, this is something I would listen to just regularly, you know? <laughs> and so I kind of wondered how that came about as far as if they, you know, had – initially had that idea or if it was something they just kind of farted around with and wrote it but okay so you're mentioning you know kind of the the band you know possessing and 
kind of uh, tossing in some of those elements as well from the, the 90s band then. Yep. Love that. Exactly. Damn. But it's, they awesome. Would, they would, you know, we had that song for them. David already was already kind of writing this whole long song. Because like, we it all had the movie like in different parts. So Dave was already making this whole thing. After the movie was made, Dave was like, I'm going to make a Dream Widow album. So <laughs> it's, I'm a super heavy metal fan. Like I'm more of like really heavy metal kind of a guy. Um, and I mean, Dave knocked it out of the park. So, I mean, get ready for those who are ready. <laughs> Dang. Wow. Okay. I mean, that'll be, that, that's, I, I'm excited for it, you know, as far as hearing it too. And, and I even vocally, you know, kind of hearing what, you know, might singing might go over that too. Uh, that, that, that'll be sick. I'm excited. You said it, may, it might be coming out this next week. I think it's coming out this next week, uh, next Friday, I believe. Shit. Okay. Well, either way, I'll, I'll keep my eyes out here. That, that's awesome. Uh, so yeah, now as far as uh, a new excitement for the project arose after, you know, you had showed the band the first, you know, couple of edits. Uh, what can you tell us about these first scenes that they actually saw once, you know, looking and, you know, discovering that this was an actual legit movie? Well, you know, going on to that question, we started right before the pandemic. So we started shooting and my everybody like uh, the, the director of photography started like started shooting the whole movie and uh, you know then we got shut down the world shut down COVID put everybody at home so I ended up editing a lot of this movie in my office at home via remote with an editor because um, you couldn't go anywhere it was really mm-hmm. it's crazy uh, room with the like working oh hold on hold on I want Go back. <laughs> yeah. Editors like over in England, you know, okay, hold on. Oh, I, hold on. I know I got this. We got to scroll back. It just takes a lot of time. Uh, so we edited as much footage as we had. I think we had about 20 days worth of shooting that we had. We only had like seven days left to shoot and the world shut down. So we edited everything we had together in like just r- a rough cut. And we ended up basically like showing the guys and you know, they were pumped about what we had. No, no visual effects were done, you know, nothing like that. But, you know, when they saw the product that we were doing and knowing that we were actually going for, like, a real, like, movie, they got So that was kind of, you know, that was it. That's what got them going. Okay. Okay. I love that. And that's, that's awesome too. Uh, kind of listening into some of Dave's, you know, uh, interviews as well. He had mentioned that some years ago, he actually lived in this house and this was kind of how it came about with them recording the album and then ultimately filming as well. Were there any, you know, moments that were kind of funny as far as seeing, you know, his personal experience with the house or maybe being like, you know, Hey, we should, we should film this scene here. Cause this, this floor is always creaky and I just wanted to bust this shit or did anything come, you know, from like personal memories from him? Not really. We just kind of like, you know, taking that they were my house down the street, and he kind of like, and then they did record "Medicine at Midnight" at that house, so um, they got to know the, the layout of the place. It's just a strange house, it's like very weird. You know, man, it's super weird. Um, so you know, we going to the house. We just. You know, when you're making a movie that's a one location movie, it's really hard to keep things interesting. So we really milked that whole place. We shot every edge or every part of that whole house. Like, <laughs> okay. There, the solar panel thing that heats the pool that the guys are run underneath and hide from Dave under the parking lot. You know, we even there's a garage that we actually turned into the basement set. So there is the actual staircase that in the back of the house that went to this little teeny basement about the size of like a closet. And that's when you see, like, when, they, when he goes to the back of the house, he opens the door and he looks down the stairs. That's actually the, the, the stairs in the house that go to this little basement. But when you see Dave come down the stairs and into the basement, uh, Michael Barton, our, our uh, designer, he basically took the garage of the house and created that whole thing and made turned the garage into the downstairs basement set. So oh, that shit. Okay. Garage. That, that wow. was. And he built a staircase so you could still see his, you know, people coming <laughs> <laughs> the the things that you ha- it's actually funny that you mentioned that too because i was talking with uh with michael you know and talking about you know him and working on brightburn about how they had to go to two different locations for the barn as well as the house there and uh, i i kind of think i started thinking about that as far as even with this you know with having the central location if there was anything that had to be filmed elsewhere or if it was something so you're you're saying the only thing that really changed was just the basement was to the garage but still on the same property well no it, but I, and it's funny because you know the the, the garage what 
But the scene with Rami and Whitney, um, because it was so bloody and so gory and so gnarly, you know, we actually, there is a guest house that, that's on the property. It's like when you see the guys eating food and they're like talking about staying at the house, you hear Rami go, I get the guest house. And he runs to this little house that you see that's like part of the property. That's Rami's room. So we shoot, we went in there and we actually got started shooting that scene in that place. But we were still trying to figure out, is this going to work with all the blood that we're going to shoot or are we going <laughs> to completely destroy? So we ended up knowing that how much we were going to do, it was going to, it would probably have destroyed that whole, like, <laughs> oh, <that>. no. <laughs> so they built a replica out in the parking lot of the house when we had to do that scene. So we started shooting that scene in the actual, you know, guest house. And then when it got time to do the whole, like, gnarly, you know, business, that was an actual set that was built and just oh. replicated that, you know, that's, that's how we trashed the place. Oh, <laughs> man. It was nuts. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I guess it, for, for what we can say, yeah, kind of continuing on that a little bit, that was one of the, the, the raddest uh, and most ridiculous kills that I had seen uh, in recent memory. What can you tell us about that? And it, did it take a couple of takes as far as pulling that off? Or was that something where it was like, we have to get this one? You had to get that one because there's really, there was, because <laughs> once that, there was so much blood in that scene that there, it, and that you couldn't, you know, we would have to stop in like for a day and we would have to repaint the whole scene and everything and clean all the curtains and everything. So that's one of the things where you set all the, you three overhead, we throw over my bicycle, camera over the for the back, cover all the bits. Once that blood starts going, you know, you got to oh God that the chainsaw rig that was under the bed, it, it, it wasn't a high, it was the same that Gardner built. It was like a robotic, like, transformer thing on the track that, like, was programmed by a computer that came up with a chainsaw blade and, like, saw things and moved it. Like, <laughs> that, that's, and that's how that, how that worked. That was no one under the bed. It was like, a, it was like this mechanism. Like, it was fully built. I have video of it somewhere. I <laughs> oh, <talking>. my God. <laughs> yeah. It was like the, the Jaws, like, shark set up underneath this damn thing. <laughs> yeah. That's the other thing. Is like, they would have had, if, if we had shot that in the guest house, they would have had to raise the bed so high to get that mechanism underneath it to make it work. Um, and that would have been really, you know, it would have been a really hard thing to do. And I know our camera guys, I just see Bryce just showed up. Um, he's on here. He's one of our camera operators. Uh, I mean, they like doused in blood, you know, they were right there in the whole mix. And, you know, it was the blast seeing how much of a geyser it was. We were basically trying to beat the amount of blood that was in Nightmare on Elm Street 1 when Giant, <laughs> you know, I, I still don't think we did if that's, you know, you know, the horror master right there. And, uh, close. <laughs> pull upside down set and the blood just came out. But we had these actual cannons that shot the blood up. You know, and, and there was these giant tanks of blood that were just there. And it was completely insane. Like, <laughs> and the guys had for that. And it came off really well. You know, oh, I, there, man. There, I, I keep seeing that people send to me. It's really funny. It's like when they show Texas Chainsaw Massacre, like the new one. And it says, I got this chainsaw. And then it shows Dave and it says, hold my beer. Because we have <laughs> <laughs> no offense to the, like, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. No offense, but it's kind of funny seeing that was, I was that kidding. is funny I, I haven't seen that yet I, I, that, that that is that's a that's a great you know it's it's one of those things where sometimes the internet can be a real son of a bitch and there's other times where it's like all right you win today sir <laughs> oh yeah you know it, 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 it can crush you and it can make you laugh your ass off so uh, you know. that's that's great that's great okay so uh, i mean uh, going along you know further with projectiles the scene with dave you know he's out by the pool and just a completely ridiculous projectile puking. How is this pulled off? Because it almost like cans, not just in front of him, but, you know, off to the side where you're seeing that there's not like a pump off to, to or at least seemingly so, you know, from behind him. How, how did this get pulled off? That was all, but that's, that, so in, in, when you make movies, you have to do something like that. It's all through plate shots and, and visual effects. Cause there's obviously no way we could have done that, you know, in any other way. And the amount of, of puke that was coming out, you know, there's, you couldn't really hide like a tube of like like a fire hose shooting that i mean it's like a fire hose amount that was coming out of them <laughs> right um you know it's like we're supposed to be like you're supposed to be funny and like ridiculous all the time 
So we just basically set Dave in the shot, locked the cameras off. He got down and he would just sit there and go, and he would do his thing. And then once that was done, we'd take Dave out. We'd take the guys out of the background and we'd line up with the overlay on the screen and we'd bring in the, the visual effects or, I mean, the, or the, the, the effects guys. And they would put the hose right where his mouth was on an overlay on the screen. And then we would just lock it down and then we would shoot all that, you know, and, and we were <laughs> okay. We honestly, we weren't going for like full realism. We were going for like complete absurdity. ridiculous. And yeah. <laughs> that's what we're trying to do in this movie. You know, it's so funny. You know, like some people are like, oh God, this so, that looks so fake. It's like, yeah, we're, that's kind of what we were trying to do. <laughs> it's a comedy. <laughs> right, right, right. And, and I mean, I, I, I guess I haven't necessarily seen that or anything like that. But it is funny when people, you know, kind of mention those things too. When, you know, if you see some of the things that happened earlier on in the movie, or you just kind of feel the overall kind of not directly slapsticky, you know, emotion behind it. But it, it, it's very, it, you know, it's very, you know, kind of tongue in cheek in a sense, you know. And it's like for anybody to say something, you know, that's ridiculous like this, like uh, maybe you're just you're you're not getting what's what's supposed to be happening here. My favorite comment is is from is critics saying, "Oh man, the acting! Oh my god!" And it's like, guys, we're that's the point. We're trying to make a. We're not trying to go for like an Oscar here. We were going for like. <laughs> we're, we're not trying to like win a gold statue, you know. It, and and that's right. like you know it's like it's back to the Beatles or the Monkees or Kiss and those things. It's that's we were going for that initial vibe, and that's like that we you know that was the whole thing with this. Movie. We're setting out to do that. That's what we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just funny when you kind of you're like, oh my god, or like the you know, like the vomit thing. Oh my god, it was so cheesy. It's like, yeah, it's supposed to be cheesy because that's funny. That's the point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> you, know? I, I, you know, I mean, and, and there's even different movies in you know in the past that you know were supposed to be serious, like an Evil Dead when that initially first came out wasn't supposed to be a comedy. You know, like then I could see the directors yeah. of being like. Oh shit! I wasn't even trying to make anything funny here, <laughs> no. But but yeah, I, I I absolutely I loved and appreciated everything about this movie. Felt like it was friends growing up that somehow stumbled across you know the opportunity to make a legit version of like shit that they were doing when they were kids, like a, a better version yeah. though. You know, not to say like it's like anything bad. I I loved it. I thought the the passion and the yeah. fun behind it was was absolutely there. So bravo! I love that. <laughs> And that was the whole thing. It's really more about just having fun and making a fun movie, throwing back to the band movies, but also having a good horror element, making it gory as hell, and just really throwing it all in there. We're through the kitchen sink, you know, and that's like, <laughs> do. And, you know, the people that get it, they really get it. And the people like at my age, you know, like they, these are the kind of movies I grew up on. I enjoyed that. Like, you know, it's like the when kills in a movie that are funny, you know, it's like the Friday the 13th kills. You go to see how creatively stupid and ridiculous the kills are. And that's <laughs> you know, we weren't going for like like deep, dark, like super serious thing. We were going for straight up like laughs. Yeah, and we did absolutely. I, 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 I'm I'm stoked with what we got. Yeah, I, I love that. I love that. With with the you know some of the over top. Uh, you know, gore and some of the effects that were in this and some of the gags. Was there anything that maybe pushed the envelope a little too far and you had to back back away from as far as for final cuts? No, because we didn't care. We didn't have a studio at the time, like, at all, really. We were all independent shooting. And so, we, you know, when I talked to Dave about it, too, we said, shoot it how we're going to do it, and that's what we're going to do. And, you know, awesome. that's the thing. The one thing we did have to pull back on the original cut was the opening. That was way more violent than what we see. And it's still a violent movie, but like my opening and I really super gnarly, and people are kind of like, ooh, we gotta pull that back. It's just like, it was rough. It showed way more, more stuff that was happening. And oh, jeez. Like, it was super bad. And uh, the thing is, <laughs> I know you're going into it, you shoot more, you can pull it back. You don't. Do as much as you can, and when people say, "Hey, we got to," but other than that, the, the rest of the thing were, you know, we got it for what it was. Uh, you know, it's funny because, like, we, I did later videos that we talked about for uh, on, on your show. And there's one one effect that that we want that we did with a with a whip that's on my truck that pops the guy's head off. Mm -hmm. It kind of didn't work right on that thing. So 
me and Tony talked about it and said, this time it's going to work well. And that's why we see the Will Forte guy and why it goes so high. Because <laughs> we, wanted to, we, wanted to redo, we wanted to redo on that gag. And that's the awesome. same rig that we used in the Slayer videos. The same dummy, the same thing. It's the exact same thing. <laughs> we gassed. We gassed it up so the head would go boom and go flying like way out of front. <laughs> <laughs> that so, is awesome. Little, that so, is we awesome. Got to read. I love that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Killed two birds with one stone. You're like, man, I have to get that gag to go. And uh, you got the opportunity. Shit. <laughs> yeah. well, in the video, it's like when you see that happen, when we hit the winch thing and the thing starts to pull. You know, we didn't have like any like you know, like electricity really out there to pump up the compressors. We only had these like basic like canisters that were compressed. So when you see the thing, it just kind of goes. His head's there, and it, it just goes poop and kind of pops off. Yeah. You know. Right. <laughs> Actually, this one we were like, okay, we can like pump up these compressors hardcore, and that's why that head goes rocketing <laughs> off when. The... <laughs> so that. Oh was... man, I, I just. I just imagine a neighbor driving, you know, and somehow that thing just comes and plops on their windshield, you know, as they're going down the road. Like, what in the hell? Well, <laughs> you know, funny, like, you know, and I've talked about it in a couple other people's uh, interviews, is that there is a, um, in that scene where we did with Rami with all that blood, at the end of the day, when we were walking down to, to go to our cars after we got done shooting, there was a river of blood going down the streets of Encino. Like, I'm talking, I have a picture of it, and it's like, it's, a, it was like a river of blood. I mean, we used oh. more. That's the movie I've ever worked in. I've been doing for over a <laughs> no, no, This is no joke. The most blood I've ever seen on a set. Holy shit. Wow. <laughs> Jesus. With uh, So uh, kind of moving on from here as far as some of the cameos, you know, we mentioned, you know, John Carpenter earlier in here, uh, you know, and, and, and different, you know, uh, uh, things that maybe felt a little bit more of the wheelhouse as far as from uh, Dave or the Foo Fighters. Uh, you had participation, you know, you had John Carpenter, Kerry King, and Jason Truss. We were just talking about the, the Slayer videos. And uh, those, you know, kind of felt like maybe a little bit of your, you know, like sprinkling of in ingredients. What can you tell me about uh, uh, Jason and Carrie being in the movie and uh, their, their parts? That was exactly it. Jason's my good luck. I always try to put Jason um, He's an awesome actor. He's a filmmaker. The guy's so talented. It's insane how good he actually is. Um, and we get along really well. So I always, I always try to bring him on to whatever I can do. And I've worked on this stuff too because but he's a really great creative you know, filmmaker. Um, you know, Bill Forte was my choice. I, I called Will because uh, I worked on MacGruber and the guy to play this he's oh, the yeah, delivery guy. Okay. I just said, you know, we it was good. We it was supposed to be told them for at one point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at some point it was all it was like Vin Diesel was up to play it. It was like and finally we're like. Around this thing, I'm like, oh, okay, let's just make. I'm gonna make a phone call. Like, I know, I know who's gonna be perfect for this. So I called Will, <laughs> and, and he came in and did the, the part. Uh, you know, Carrie King from Slayer. That was me also calling in, like, you know, and and, and uh, you know, Dave knew Carrie also, obviously from the band stuff and being a fan of Slayer. But I was like, let's just call Carrie because it'd be really funny, you know, if Carrie can come in and play this, you know, part in the movie because now he's like the you know the the main like sound tech roadie guy. That like you know it's, it's totally not him because he's an amazing guitar player and an awesome dude. Um, so it's kind of fun seeing him play the character, and he really kind of I think he did probably take like what he's dealt with with other people, but a bit on the road just being like, all right, whatever. It's like it's everyday job for them. I think I think Carrie probably channeled that. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, me and my wife actually were trying to find uh, me and me and my wife Adrian were sitting there going, all right, we need to make sure that we we. Uh, find a great opening actress for this because the movie's going to be funny and, and, and you know, it's going to be a lot of comedy. But what we wanted to do was we wanted to make sure that it was dark and gnarly in the very beginning. That was the thing. We needed a really good actress in the beginning of it to show the emotions of what was going on to really get, set the, the, the violence tone. So mm -hmm. we, me and my wife, we sat through basically a, couple, a bunch of like, you know, different uh, audition tapes. And then Jenna's came up from, and it was a thing from you. And 
we just saw her performance in that and it's like a really emotional thing and me and adrian both were like oh that's that's her right there we got to see if you know we got to see if we can get her not knowing anything about her being frame or any of these other movies we just saw her performance and said she's fantastic and so we talked to wendy our casting agent and, and set out to see if we could get her on there and sure enough she came aboard so you know that was huh, that was wow. trying to like you know basically um pick out the actress from the beginning you know dave brought in like lionel richie you know even steve Vai, like whenever we see vice like steve <laughs> Vai, you don't see his hands because that's when the guy gets ready when he gets the song and i guess <laughs> a couple houses down. So then he just, you know, Oh yeah, I'll come on down. So he just walked down to the house and brought like his pedals, set him down. And then he had to play Dave's guitar, which he's totally not used to. So, you know, he was like, Oh, I don't know. I don't know. This guitar is all wrong, <clears throat> which was kind of funny. <laughs> um, so Steve Lionel, you know, they came in Whitney with his choice, you know, uh, I believe Dave Garland. I mean, uh, Jeff Garland was like, I, I think was Dave's choice or management's choice. Um, you know, it was just kind of a joint, like who we were going to bring in. You know, and John and John Carpenter, Dave got John because Dave helped out Daniel go. And John was like, You helped out Daniel a long time ago. Like I think he like went on the road with him for a little bit. And he goes, I'm gonna give you guys a I wanna write you guys a theme song, you know. And then we just we decided to take Whoa. it a little further and say, Let's see if we can play some you know, like a character and turn up. He's like, Yeah, I'll come in. It was as simple as that, you know, it's kinda of great. So there was a there was a joint Dave me you know, me and my wife, like, kind of put it, like, like making the decisions of, of like, cast-wise. And also, sure. crew-wise, okay. you know, like, you know, she was, she basically staffed the makeup you know, department, not, not, not the special effects, you know, that was Tony Gardner, but our makeup crew, and she also did hair, um, you know, she screwed up that with me. Like, I would, I always bounce ideas off of her. Like, you know, sure. we both work in the business. And if, if I need help somewhere, she's always there for me. So she helps out a lot. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. And with that, you know, special effects thing too, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's kind of a dynamic where you kind of go over and show the pencil drawings and like, I want to do this absolutely ridiculous thing, but is this going to work? And, you know, she's might be like, eh, probably not. <laughs> or yeah, absolutely. But we're going to have to change some things. Some, sometimes things are super unrealistic that I, I try to <laughs> Like those Slayer videos, like like the one in the snow. I'll never forget that me and Adrian mixed up all the blood in the night before, and, and I took I took her uh, the, the little blood pumps. I forgot what they're called right now, but they're, oh, the Hudson sprayers. We had these two giant Hudson sprayers filled with fake blood because originally in those videos we had these crosses that were supposed to be stuck in the ground and blood was going to come out of them. But yeah. up there, the guy couldn't figure. Out. The crosses were terrible. The guy brought he he was yeah, he, it it was a whole thing, and he couldn't. <laughs> and it was, he brought these crosses that look brand new, and then we were like, okay, well, those are going to work. And also, how are you going to bury them in the snow? Because the snow, you know, the ground is frozen. He's, and then he went out there and tried to do it. So then I ended up going out there with just the, the Hudson sprayers, and me and Eric, the director of photography on those, just started spraying blood around the amps, and it worked fine. But going back to those things, it's kind of, you know, sometimes my expectations aren't real, and I have to bounce ideas off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for sure. For sure. I appreciate that. And and I, I got to say, too, it felt like a very alternate reality, you know, seeing John Carpenter, you know, kind of thinking of him as like, you know, a director or I guess a composer, too. But, you know, seeing him as like a music producer or seeing Carrie as a as a guitar tech, I was like, I mean, if I didn't know who the guy was, he would have been the epitome of what I've ever known of a guitar tech or a, a roadie of some sort. It was absolutely hilarious seeing him in that role. I was like, holy shit, this is insane. Well, <laughs> of people that are see this movie. It goes from the people that started listening to the Foo Fighters like they first started to the people that are actually like the fighters are and they're like, what's this horror film? Some people guy and go, I don't know who that is. It's amazing like, <laughs> through our world of like conversations growing up of like, who's important. Like, because some people won't even know who John Carpenter is when he pops up. You know, and when we were at the premiere, the true fans when he pops up are like, "Yeah!" You know, yeah. they were all super. <laughs> they're like, they're like well, "Who's that guy?" I don't know. Why are people cheering him? It's, it's <laughs> right. You know, it, it's it's uh, it's a whole generation. <laughs> yeah, I, and, and I, I think it's another thing that that's appreciated too with 
it being kind of a splicing of genres, you know, where like we've talked about like different things like skateboarding and video games and, you know, kind of how they kind of mix, you know, the things of metal or thrash, you know, and having something like this where, you know, kids that might not necessarily be into horror, you know, are seeing something and they are in love with, you know, the Foo Fighters. And then they see something they're like, well, why is everybody, you know, cheering on this guy and go back and look into it and like, oh shit, he made some of the best horror movies ever. Maybe I should look into his stuff too. So yeah, bra bravo for that. I didn't even think of that, but you know, kind of a, a good introductory, uh, you know, stepping stone in, in a sense if, uh, if people don't know who that is. So I love that. Yeah. I mean, Last younger crowd to like, you know, oh yeah, that's, you know, John Carpenter. Or like, he will go back with the references of the things that we actually did in the movie to try to reference like the Easter eggs of like certain shots. Like, you know, when Will Forte is walking up the, the stairs to the house, it's a full on rip off of the exorcist, you know? And, you know <laughs> okay. They're just complete rip offs. And, and that's what it was intention, intended to do. We were trying to like have fun with it. So when people see that, they go, oh, check that out. Even the book, they're like, oh, it's the Necronomicon. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I even like too how, how the record player almost kind of looked like a skull. Like it was like, you know, kind of the eyes up top. And maybe it wasn't necessarily like supposed to be, but, it, or maybe like a face, you know, type thing, how it just kind of looked like the epitome of evil and it's going to spout out something that's going to possess you. Uh, I, I, I love that. <laughs> Thing, that 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 thing total story point in the movie you know from where dave finds it down the basement to even in the beginning whenever they're mixing the record now you see that that reel to reel is up with john carpenter and jason tross when they're doing the stuff while the guy individually playing their their stuff they're using the reel to reel now all the way to the ending when taylor is playing the, the bit of the drums mm -hmm. it's all about that reel to reel now because it was part of like the the past with the dream widow band and what was going to be the vessel you know with dave of the song to bring forth, you know, the end of times, I guess you'd say. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, with, with all the, you know, the smaller details with things, I guess, uh, and I'm just starting to think, was there anything to how the characters got killed? Maybe we don't necessarily say, you know, uh, who, or, uh, but was there anything as far as like the, the, the timing of who was going to die first and who was going to die last? Like, was there anything with that? I think that the, I think that honestly, because Nate and Pat are really kind of the original guys, um, I think they're the final, the, our final girls in, in, the, in the movie, I would, uh -huh. I would call them. Um, so we wanted them to end up being the last. Um, oh, okay. Other than that, they're, you know, like Taylor had to be like, part of like the whole song. Really, there wasn't really too much thought into that, but I do think that Pat and Nate were very the last two. Um, mm. Okay. And so that, that was definitely, but script wise, we just down the way oh. it was planned. Sure. Okay. Okay. Got ya. La last up here, we were mentioning, you know, Will Forte and his part there, uh, you know, and, and he plays this delivery driver that's very in intent on getting his band CD to the Foo Fighters and to Dave. What can you tell us about this band bone structure and the, the, the CD's cover art that's on, <laughs> that's, that, that made a, an okay. appearance here in this movie? <laughs> The CD art in the in it actually comes from my old band because uh, we my old band used, was a band called Lick Fifty Sevens, which is a terrible <laughs> name, but we had a band back in the days, and we had these stickers. Sticker, I have a picture of it somewhere. There's a sticker where it's like this skeleton guy kind of pointing his finger, like he's leading the way, and he's got this booze bottle, and it's written exactly like those letters of bone structure, and it's just <laughs> a name that. We so we, I just, I just told, I, I just said, hey, look. Can you just emulate this stupid thing that we did for my <laughs> punk band? <laughs> kind of a throwback there. And it's funny because even in the movie, my band's CD, you have to really know or look for it. It's actually next to the reel to reel. You know, like there's like, it's right oh, there. So, <laughs> oh, no shit. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. Where did the, the band name come from? Was that something that somebody just spouted out that sounded uh, perfectly ridiculous? It was just in the script. It's just what Rebecca oh, and Jeff okay. Ewer actually wrote in there. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, so ridiculous. I <laughs> make it look like Yeah. Okay. All right. With with the detail in the cover art and, and the, the name, I, 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 I thought that there was, or at least I was hoping that there was going to be some sort of story behind that too, or with all of the musicians that were involved with this. So uh, it being involved with you, that's, that's awesome. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, only I'm going to really get that for the most part, or like a few people in Pensacola, Florida, or my members might notice that and be like, oh, that's, oh, God, you know. <laughs> but 
that to sometimes when you're making a movie. Say, oh, I'm, you know, this is something that kind of came from my past. I'm gonna, I want to put that on there. So that's that's uh, kind of what I did. Man, so dumb. This. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. Dude, this this has been absolutely awesome man thank you so so much once again bj for taking the time today and uh once uh once you once th they announced and you announced that you were a part of this project uh i i had to get a hold of you because i was like oh man i'm so excited for this and it definitely uh went beyond my expectations okay. even. so anybody that's watching if you haven't seen the movie please go and check it out uh it's just as ridiculous as you're gonna <laughs> you you would just assume and and you can see it on on video on demand now too. I think it, it's out now, so you can actually. Oh, you know, really? It's awesome to see it in the theaters, but now I believe you can get it on like you know Amazon Prime or or wherever. I never watch video. I always wait for the Blu-rays. So yeah, so <laughs> yeah, you <can> there. <laughs> Sick. That's aw Is is there any like span as far as is there going to be a, a physical release or is there something just with yeah. VOD right now? There will be a Blu-ray, you know, DVD release. I'm not sure when the dates are for that. Um, Sick. Uh, there will that will be coming out. Yeah. So. Oh, uh, man. Yeah, that's that's Can't where wait. in all time it all lives on. So. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, dude. Thank you so so much once again. This has been absolutely awesome. Have fun in the Dominican Republic, whatever the hell you have going on over there, and uh, stay uh, stay safe, man. <laughs> Done. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. You take care. Thank you very much again. Thank you. All right. Yeah. See you, man. Bye bye. He's a lo-fi horror guy. Yeah, he's kind of a guy, but he is so lo-fi, lo-fi horror guy. Yeah, bing, 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 bing. Lo-fi horror guy has been recorded in front of a live studio audience.